Uh, this is a, a project that examined uh, what we call the age factor, which is the age, uh, so the optimal age at one at which one should start learning a second language or a foreign language. And this is actually one of the most debated topics in the field of second language acquisition. But in addition to looking at this starting age of learning, we also looked at uh, a wide range of uh, factors, some of them that we can categorize as child-specific factors. You'll hear more about these factors later. And then contextual factors taking place outside and inside the classroom. So this was a, a project that was financed by the EFF and we've also had some funding from the Ministry of Education, even though they're not too happy about our findings perhaps so far, but uh, I hope yeah, that they will keep us funding us. Uh, the uh, project is interdisciplinary in nature. Um, so uh, Cern and I, we are linguists. Uh, by training and then specializing in second language acquisition. Then we have Mikkel Hansen, who is here today, who was a great addition to the, to the project because he's a developmental psychology from the University of uh, Paris 8. And uh, it was very important to have a, a developmental psychologist in the project because some of the factors that we look at are actually psychological in nature. Then we have Jörn Lauwitzen, who is also here who is from the Department of Business and Economics, professor there. And he was very important in, in developing the statistical models that we used in the, in the project. So if you have any uh, difficult statistical questions, then you're, I'm sure we're able to, to help you out. Then we have Henry Cash, uh, who is also here today. And uh, he's a representative of university colleges, which you know university colleges are the places where future um, primary school teachers um, yeah, um, educate themselves. And then there were three PhD pro uh, students who are no longer PhD students. They all finished their, their dissertations. Sina Hannibal Jensen, who's here today. Catalin Finivesi, who is also here today. And then Mary Auswissen, who is not here today. So this is the outline of the talk. So I'll start with the background and motivation for the project. And I'll extend a little bit in that because I know that, you know, here in Diaz, most of us, they, you don't know my, probably very much about this topic. So I hope to be able to explain things so that you can follow. Then I'll go into the method, the participants, the design, the instruments that we use to measure uh, English proficiency and, uh, and, uh, and the different factors. Main findings. Conclusions, main conclusions, and some pedagogical implications from the findings, and then a little bit about future lines of research that could be interesting from, yeah, from the perspective of this project. So the motivation for the study is very simple, and this is a change in educational law in uh, 2014, whereby English is starting being taught in the first grade instead of the third grade which uh, had been the norm since 2002. Probably you remember this change of law. And this change of law gave, gave us the unique opportunity to compare the development of English in two groups of children. An early starter group who studied in the first grade and a late starter group that studied in the third grade. And both groups started with English instruction in school within the same year, in 2014. So in 2014, the old system and the new system coexisted. So as the, as the title of the, of the, um, of the talk uh, um, illustrates, there's this wide assumption in the field of second language acquisition that the younger is the better. So it's believed that uh, younger learners of foreign languages are more efficient learners. And therefore, the younger they start learning a, a second language or a foreign language, the better, so the higher levels of L2 proficiency they will achieve. And um, <clears throat> this assumption is very much linked to what we know as the critical period hypothesis, which states that um, people are worse at learning languages after puberty, uh, mainly because of maturation constraints dealing with uh, brain plasticity and the progressive lateralization of the language functions in the left hemisphere of the brain. I mean, this uh, critical period hypothesis is quite contested. There's a lot of debate in the field about whether it's right or not. 
But in any case, um, the, the assumption the, of the younger the better is actually in line with the educational policies that have been implemented in, in Europe in the last decades, uh, by which the age at which children start learning uh, foreign languages in school have been uh, dropping uh, in the last years. So here you can see, um, uh, uh, this is from a EU report from Euridice, and it says that the starting age of the first foreign language, which usually is English, as a compulsory subject in most European countries is when they are, when they are six, seven years old, and that includes uh, Denmark. There's some variability, there are some countries that, still, that start earlier or later, but most of the countries start uh, when they are six, seven years old, like here with the new reform. So this is the assumption. But then the question is, is this assumption true? What do you think? Is it true? Mm, well, <laughs> you know, as with many things in life, there's not a straight answer because <laughs> because the answer depends on the, on the learning context. So, research in what we call naturalistic settings. So naturalistic settings are uh, immersion context. So when one learns the second language in the linguistic community, like the country, like for example, a country where the language is spoken, like for example, as foreigners learning Danish in Denmark, okay? That would be a naturalistic setting. <laughs> So research shows that older learners actually have a rate advantage, so they learn faster than younger learners. But younger learners, on the other hand, have what we call an ultimate attainment advantage, a horrible concept, long-term advantage. So even though these, older, these younger learners, even though they are slower at first, then they end up by achieving a higher levels of proficiency than the older learners. So when you measure the linguistic abilities after residing in the country for several years, a minimum of 10 years, then younger learners do are better at foreign language than older learners. So we could say that in naturalistic settings, yeah, the younger is the better. But in traditional instructed settings, that is when you learn the foreign language in a classroom context, and where there's not much exposure to that language outside the classroom context, then all the learners still show, research shows that all the learners have a rate advantage, but younger learners do not show this long-term advantage that it has been shown in naturalistic settings. Why? There are three interrelated um, explanations. The first one is that uh, because they are in an instructed uh, settings, they don't have much contact with the language. So therefore, in order to surpass, to be better than the uh, older learners, they would need more time, so more instruction years. The second one is that because of this limited amount of contact with the language, then younger learners cannot capitalize on the advantage that they're supposed to have on implicit learning. Implicit learning, I don't know whether you, uh, implicit learning is like a statistical learning, is learning without awareness, in the same way that we learn when we learn our mother tongue. So we learn by finding patterns from language samples. And the third uh, reason is that younger learners are supposed to have lower metalinguistic abilities than older learners. Metalinguistic abilities means the ability to reflect on language, consciously about language. And this is claimed that in a classroom context, these metalinguistic abilities can be very useful because usually in many classrooms, there's some kind of conscious uh, focus on language forms. So because of this, this is how research, yeah, have explained this lack of um, uh, long-term advantage for younger learners. This is research that has been conducted in different countries, like in Spain, in Germany, in Switzerland, for example. We also have to remember that age of onset is not the only factor that can explain second language acquisition. So research has shown that there are two, I mean, people categorize these factors into child-specific factors and contextual factors. So to give you a little bit of an idea what these factors are, because these are the factors actually that we included in our study. So we have 
In addition to age of onset, we have gender. So there's also this widespread assumption that girls, women are better at learning foreign languages than men. We'll see about that. It's not always the case. You'll hear in a bit. Then we have something that we call foreign language classroom anxiety. And that is, this is defined as a unique form of anxiety that learners experience when learning or using the second language. So for example, if they're afraid of making mistakes and be corrected in class, or they're afraid of speaking up in class in front of their classroom peers. So this factor has been shown to impact negatively on second language development. And uh, there's some research that shows that younger learners usually have lower degrees of foreign language classroom anxiety when you compare them with older learners. Another one is what we call English competence beliefs, which means this refers to the uh, learner's subjective evaluations, evaluations of how good they are at language. So perceptions of being good or bad at the second language also in relation to their peers, their classroom peers. So research, some research shows that um, younger children are, usually have higher ECB beliefs than older learners. So they often think that they're good. But as they grow older, uh, that's quite cute, but as they grow older, <laughs> then they become more realistic about their competence. And then usually their, their uh, ECB beliefs, they tend to go down. Then we have motivation, and has motivation is the factor that has received more attention in the field of second language acquisition. And an important distinction here is between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So intrinsic motivation is that you are driven by enjoyment or interest in a given activity, in this case, learning a, a language. Extrinsic means that you are motivated by some external force, like your parents. And research shows that uh, younger children tend to be more extrinsically motivated than older children. Another in important concept is what we call ideal L2 self. And this refers the, to the idea to which extent children uh, or yeah, learners in general are able to see themselves, picture themselves as future speakers of the language. Would I picture myself as being able to speak in English, uh, uh, talk in English with native speakers, etc. Then we have attitudes, like uh, children's attitudes towards English lessons, so the different activities that they do in a lesson, if they're singing, uh, writing, reading, listening to songs, and also attitudes towards the English language as such. Like, for example, do they like to learn new words in English? Do they like to listen to English songs? Yes. Then we have language aptitude. Language aptitude is also a big factor. There's been a lot of research on language aptitude. And this can be defined as the learner's capacity for learning second languages. There are several standardized tests that measure um, language aptitude. And it's thought to um, be composed or of different dimensions. One is uh, analytical ability, so the ability to understand, for example, the function of words in sentence, what is the subject, what is the direct object, you know, these kind of things that we linguists are interested in. Another one is to be able to find patterns in the input and, you know, inductive learning, so whether you can guess the rules of, of a particular language, a grammatical uh, rule, on the basis of being exposed to the, to the to language samples, and also memory. Memory is also supposed to be, have an important um, uh, component of language aptitude. And then we have learner mindset. And learner mindset is a factor that is a relatively newcomer to the field of second language acquisition. I mean, we, I discovered it through Mikkel, our uh, psychologist in the project, because this is very much, it's based on the work of Carol Dweck, who is a um, psychologist at the Stanford University. And she makes this distinction between what is a fixed versus an incremental or growth mindset. So fixed mindset means that you think that intelligence, that a given ability, that a given talent, you are born with it. And it's fixed, and then it cannot be changed much. Whereas if you have more an incremental or growth mindset, you think that 
this ability, this talent can be, de can be developed through effort, through hard work. And previous research shows that you know, this can be, I mean, this has been tested, the, the role of, le of learner's mindset has been tested in, in other areas like mathematics, and uh, there's not so much work done in, in second language acquisition, but some of our work shows that um, uh, young, older learners tend to be more, have to be, tend to have a more incremental mindset than younger children. Um, I hope you allow me because the other day, I'm a great tennis fan. And the other day I was, uh, I was watching this uh, new uh, program in Netflix, which I recommend if you like tennis. It's called Breakpoint. And then they were doing these interviews with Tony Nadal, who, you know, he, was, he is the uncle um, and, and the, the trainer of uh, Rafa Nadal. And he's a guy who always... I mean, he does a lot of inspirational talks for business, and he always talks about the, the value of effort and hard work. And in, in this uh, documentary pro uh, program, he said this sentence that I really liked. So he said, El talento principal en la vida es la capacidad de aprender. So the main talent in life is the capacity to learn, which I think resonates very well with what incremental or um, a growth mindset. Uh, is. So I think the concept is out there, so maybe they don't call it like this, but it's being uh, applied, at least in, in the tennis world, by, by this man. Then we have contextual factors. And uh, one of the main contextual factors that has received a lot of attention lately is the contact with English outside the classroom. Um, it can also be called extramural English, and uh, there's a lot of research being done now, actually, uh, on this topic because of the status of English as a global language, because uh, kids and adolescents and adults, you know, they have informal access to social media that is increasing and most of the communication is done in English. Also television programs in countries like Denmark, you know, they are, they, I mean, you see them in the original language with subtitles in, in Danish or captions in, in, in English. So there's been a lot of research in the last decade actually looking at uh, at the role of this contact with English outside the classroom in the development of uh, skills, English learning skills. And uh, a lot of studies have shown that there's this positive effect and also that um, there's an increase in this contact with English outside the school um, as the children um, grow older. Then there are some other contextual factors that are more home-related if we want to describe them like this, one is parental socioeconomic status. There's a lot of research showing in both L1 and L2 acquisition that socioeconomic status has a role to play in, 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 in language learning. And also parents' knowledge of and use of English in their daily lives. There was uh, this big project being conducted in, I think, 2012 with different countries in Europe and it I mean, in this project, one of the results was that parents' knowledge and use of their English, of English in their daily lives, had a significant effect on children's uh, development of English, probably because they, um, they can help them with the homework, or, you know, maybe they are people who tend to travel more to the families, to an English-speaking country, and, and that, you know, gives the possibility for children to be more exposed and more in contact to, with English. Yes. One interesting thing as well is that uh, the relative impact of these child-specific uh, versus contextual factors in L2 acquisition is not the same for both naturalistic and instructed settings. So, in naturalistic settings, remember, like for example, in, this is a study conducted in Canada where you have immigrant, right? The immigrant uh, children learning English there. In these kind of settings where there's a high, the possibility of having a lot of contact with the language, then child-specific factors have a stronger role. It makes sense, right? So if a lot of if you have a lot of input around and a lot of possibilities to you know to get exposed to the language, then whether you are more motivated, whether your aptitude, 
you have higher aptitude, you have, you are less, you have less anxiety, all these factors are gonna be stronger, have a stronger role. On the other hand, in traditional instructed settings where you know you are only exposed to the language in the classroom, then like this study which was conducted in China, then contextual factors have a relatively stronger role. So those children who have access, who use the language outside the classroom, they, can, uh, they, they get better scores. The thing that is interesting about Denmark is that you know, this distinction between um, naturalistic and instructed context is blurred because we know that in Denmark, children have a lot of contact to English outside the classroom. So from a project uh, that is, was done in the, in the framework of the project, we know that Danish children spend an average of six hours weekly in extramural English activities. And in a couple of studies that I conducted with a colleague from the University of Barcelona, we looked at children and adolescents learning English in Catalonia, in Barcelona, and here in Denmark. And we found that Danish children and adolescents spend significantly more time than the Spanish ones watching films in English, playing video games in English, and listening to English music. So Danish children spend quite a bit of time in, in extramural English activities also in relation to uh, children in other countries. So Danish children do not encounter the typical instructive situation that they have very limited exposure to the second language in the classroom, like for example in China or like in Spain, in other countries. So the question is, will the younger be the better than in a country like Denmark, you know, that is in between the instructed and the naturalistic settings? And what will be the relative contribution of the child-specific versus the contextual factors in L2 learning? I hope you can follow. I'm not going too fast. So in order to answer these questions, we did a multi-factor study with a mixed method approach with both qualitative and quantitative methods. So the participants, we had a total of 276 children so 165 early starters, ES, early starters. So they were in the first grade. And then 111 late starters who were in the third grade. And we had more or less the same amount of boys and girls. So these children attended six schools in Southern, in the region of uh, Southern Denmark. Uh, so we had the help when we started the project. Then, we, con the, then uh, we went to the Odense Comune muni municipality, and then they, they um, helped us uh, find the schools. So we wanted to make sure that we had the schools from different areas in Odense. So we used this location in Odense as a stratification variable. Then um, our idea was to have only public schools. But what happened is that when we started the project, then we realized mm, that many of the schools, all, basically all the schools, were following the recommendations of the ministry. So when they changed, when they made the new law, the recommendation was that first graders, they should have one lesson per week. Whereas third graders, those who started in the third grade, they would have two lessons per week. So we said, okay, here there's a bias in teaching ours. Then we tried to look for schools which had the opposite pattern and that we found in a couple of semi-private schools in Fredericia and, and Rathluskoli. Uh, anyway, we, uh, the, the, the amount of teaching hours that they had, they were included in our statistical models, and I can tell you from now that it, they did not have a significant effect. For most the schools, we had, it was quite nice because we had one early starter group and, a one, and one late starter group. So for example, Munkebia. So we had children who came from Nolte, the Nol, and they started in English in the first grade. And then we had a class that you know, came from the second year and they started in the, in the third grade. So this is the design of the study, so, which is both um, yeah, semi-longitudinal, also cross-sectional. So we had two groups, right? The early starters, the late starters. And we had three waves of data collection in 2014, first wave, so we tested them right after they started. One year after, wave two, 
one year after, the same for both groups, the early starters and the late starters. So we gave them some tests. We started giving them receptive tests, vocabulary and receptive grammar. I'll tell you a little, in a while what it is. These are the three measures that we gave along the way. Then in the second uh, group, then we gave them some phonetics, uh, some sound discrimination. And then in the third wave, we also gave them some oral production task, where they had a little interview, and then they had to describe a picture. All these uh, were individually administered. So we had a lot of teaching students who helped us collect the data. Also, they pitched these students at the time. And um, well, I was also uh, collecting some data at the beginning. It was quite fun, actually, with the children. <laughs> I, I enjoyed that. Um, so um, today, I'm going to talk more about the results from this, because th those are the results in which we have uh, yeah, results for the three waves. So to give you an idea how we tested English proficiency, uh, the vocabulary test is called the Peabody. You're going to see this PPVT in the slides. So uh, basically what the children had to do is that they heard a series of words like dog. Those words were already were recorded previously to make sure that all children were exposed to the same stimuli, that the words were pronounced equally for all the children. So, and what they had dog, and then they had to pinpoint to the um, picture that matched the word that they heard, okay? And their receptive grammar, it was pretty much the same, but here, you know, there was a, um, there were several, they, they heard sentences that illustrated uh, different English grammatical phenomena. Like, for example, they heard the cup is in the box, which was also pre-recorded, and then they had to pinpoint to the uh, picture that uh, matched, right? The, 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 the sentence that they heard. Then the child-specific factors, like foreign language classroom anxiety, English competence beliefs, motivation and attitudes, and learner's mindset, they were collected mainly by an oral questionnaire that was done in, in the children's regular classes. It was done in Danish. I have some examples here you know, for you to understand, but they were done in the learner's L1. And they were read aloud by one of us, from, from Kathleen, actually, who is here. And, uh, and we did it like this orally because some of these children, you know, they were in the first grade and they were not very, I mean, they were still illiterate to a certain extent, so we couldn't be sure that if we gave these uh, questions in written that they would be able to understand it. So that's why we did it orally. So um, if the children were asked about how much they like something, like to what extent do you like to say something aloud in English in front of the whole class, then they chose a smiley, right? Uh, um, so it was on a five-point liquor scale. And when there were questions about how much children agreed with a statement, then they, um, then they had to pick a dot, right? That was an increasing um, size, like, for example, one becomes smarter and smarter if one works hard, right? This is, for example, a question related to a uh, learner's mindset. And uh, we also some, have some qualitative individual interviews that were also carried out by, by Catalin uh, on foreign language classroom anxiety, motivation, and attitudes. And I will mention some of it later. Then we gave them some test of um, language aptitude. And we chose to measure uh, the memory aspect of language uh, aptitude. So we gave them uh, three tests. Two of them, one is called digit forward and digit backward. And this measures uh, phonological short-term memory and working memory. So basically, the children heard some uh, series of numbers that increased in length, and they had to repeat it. So if they heard 351, then they repeat the 351. That's in the digit forward. In the digit forward, uh, backward, that was more difficult because if it was 3-5, then they had to say 5-3. Okay. So this was a more difficult task. So this uh, measures uh, working memory. So working memory is like short-term memory. But I mean, you have to store something briefly in your memory, but then you have the information has to be manipulated. In this case, you have to reverse the order. And then we gave them another task that we uh, took from a, 
well-known um, language aptitude test for, for young learners. And this measures auditory and road memorabilities associated with sound meaning relations. And this, had, this is something that we have to do when we learn a language, right? You have to learn to be able to connect uh, sounds and meanings. So this was quite a bit of a hard task. So learners, the children were trained to learn numbers in an invented language, right? So for example, doll means one, bimto, ros three, up to 10, dolka is 10, binka is 20, roska is 30, and then, you know, binka ros is, okay, 20 minus three, it's 23. So, so learners were trained to learn these numbers, and then at the end, they heard the numbers in this invented language, and then they had to write down the number in a piece of paper. It's quite a, it's quite a challenging. Mm. I haven't tried it myself, so I don't know how, <laughs> how I got job. Anyway, we used them because it had been used in previous research and you know, with uh, promising results. Then the contextual factors uh, were measured um, by means of a take-home questionnaire. So the, the parents together with the children, uh, they had to indicate how often they, they were engaged, they engaged in different extramural activities like watching films in English, uh, gaming, reading, etc. We also had information about parental sex, so socioeconomic status, both in terms of income and education. So we oper operationalized these as a total yearly income and the highest level of household education. We had the information for both caregivers. And then we also asked the parents about their knowledge, subjective knowledge and use of English in their daily lives. And then um, Sinem, Hannibal Jensen, who is also here as part of her PhD dissertation, also used also all, all other methods like language diaries, where the children had to fill out a diary every day about the kind of activities that they were doing in English every day. And there are also some ethnographic interviews. You know, she uh, observed children doing some um, English activities outside the classroom, like playing uh, games and then did interviews with them, you know, observing what they were doing and yeah. Um, then the contextual factors inside the classroom, we only have um, uh, qualitative data, uh, classroom observations, and then it was some kind of that type, type of analysis that was done was conversation analysis, which is a very micro type of analysis of how um, talk occurs in, in interaction. Find. So I'm going to report the findings of two different analyses that we did because they kind of complement each other. In the first analysis that was published in a paper in 2020, we only looked at age of onset and gender. And then we include the proficiency data from the three waves. And then later on, we did a bigger <laughs> analysis with you know, age of onset, gender, and all the other factors, the child-specific uh, factors and the contextual act factors. But here we only included waves two and three. And that's why, because we wanted to have a closer link in time between the proficiency data and the data from the factors. And the data from these factors, they were collected between waves two and three or at wave three. So we thought that including the three waves was going to be problematic because there's claims in the literature saying that all these factors, of course, are dynamic. They are not as stable. So it was important for us to, so that they coincided in time. And the analyses were uh, mixed effect models and with a wave as a repeated measures and random effect for subjects. If you want to ask later how we did the models, then we can answer them. Um, so if we start with the, with the findings, the first surprise we got is that, okay, here you have the graph. So here we have the waves in X, the horizontal X, here we have the, the, um, the scores for the grammar, for the <laughs> vocabulary. The red is the early starters and the blue is for the early starters. So the first surprise was that there was a significant difference at wave one between the older and the younger children. So older learners, the, the, the older group 
were significantly better than the younger in the first wave of data collection. That was a surprise. I mean, I thought, we thought, that there was, they were going to be the same, that we did, wouldn't find any significant difference between the two. But please remember that at wave one, they, both groups had started learning English in school. So the difference in, in proficiency to start with has to do with something else. With the accumulated contact with English outside the classroom, probably, because the older learners are too old, uh, two, two years older, therefore two more years of being exposed to the language outside. And our results actually resonate very well with a, a research conducted in Flanders and in Iceland, where they've given tests of English to children before they start instruction. And they have shown that children, before they start instruction, they learn quite a bit of English. The implications of this, which I think is very important, is that the starting point for L2 English learning is not the same for both groups. So they don't start with the same level of proficiency when they start in school. Then, when looking at the development of, um, of the two groups um, across the three waves, we can see that later starters were significantly better than early starters in the three waves, but interestingly, we found a significant interaction between age of onset and weight. So a rate advantage for late starters. So the initial advantage of late starters increased significantly in waves two and three. So this was more pronounced in this analysis with the three waves for grammar. But when we did the analysis, you know, the other analysis with all the factors, the rate advantage, it was also observed for the for the vocabulary test. So this is no big surprise. So our results support the results of previous research that older children are faster in the learning, uh, in the learning process than, than, than younger learners. Then when we look at, at this development in, in light of the younger, the better debate, we, what we can see is that after one year of instruction, the early starters reach the point where the late starters start. So for the, for the early starters, it takes them one year, plus the informal learning, the learning that they, you know, that they, they do outside the classroom, to reach this, this level. And after two years, they surpass. Yes, they are better than the late starters, about 10 points in each test. And this is something you know, that was pointed out in, a, in a, the book. The Ministry of Education published a book about the reform, the results of the reform, and they had a section on this early start of English. And that's something that they stressed, because they, they refer to the, to the results of our study. And they stressed the fact that you know, the early starters were uh, beginning to be better than the later starters. But we have to remember that there is a rent advantage for the late starters, so the gap between the two groups is widening in favor of the late starters, and that these early starters, they're not catching up so far with the late starters. They are not, after two years of instruction. We also find that boys had an advantage in relation to girls. So boys had generally higher scores than girls, and we also find, found a um, significant interaction between gender and wife, which shows this rate advantage. And this was more pronounced in truck, in the, in the grammar, especially for the late started voice. And this was confirmed in the other article where we put all the factors. I mean, there was um, a late started voice, they were faster than early late boys. So that was a little bit, okay, why boys? Because then you go back to the literature and then you see that most of the studies, many studies show that actually girls are better. So what, how can we explain this finding? So our explanation has to do with the kind of activities that boys do in relation to extramural English and um, Sine uh, Hannibal Jensen, as part of, of the dissertation, she did a study with, um, and that showed that really boys and girls 
were di had different patterns of English usage outside the classroom. So boys clearly did a lot of gaming, then watching TV and listening to music, whereas girls was the reverse pattern, right? They were gaming the least. So what, is, what can be so good about gaming in relation to English learning? So the idea is that when they play video games, boys are not only playing <laughs> online games, they are also engaged in other kind of English activities. Like if they don't know a word, then they will look it up in the dictionary. Sometimes they will watch uh, YouTube videos because they need to, um, I mean, they, they have to get some information about how to advance in the game or they have to write in English. So all these other English activities that happen at the same time as they are playing games may promote their uh, learning. And, and this explanation and these findings is also uh, have been found in, in Sweden, where uh, boys have also been found to be better than girls, and also boys have been found to do a lot more gaming than girls. In relation to foreign language classroom anxiety and English competence beliefs, um, we found that, as expected, so the higher, more, the more anxiety, the lower proficiency, I mean, expected. ECB, the higher ECB, so the, the better you think you are, the better you are. Okay? Makes sense. What was interesting is that we found a, a significant interaction between these two factors. And this took us a lot of, little bit of time uh, to understand. So our way of explaining, so you, here are the, the, um, the graphs. So we can see that, well, here you have foreign language classroom anxiety. So here there are children who are more anxious. Here are the scores. Blue are the children who think, who have low ECB beliefs, so they, they don't think that they're so good. And here in red, the ones that they think they're good. So what happens is that, um, so English competence beliefs can predict or can explain um, uh, the scores, but only for those who are low anxious, right? So if you think you're good, you get high grades. If you think you're not so good, you have lower grades. Fine. But what happens with the students, the children, who have high level of anxiety? Even those who think that are very good, look at their grades. They go down. So how do we explain this? So the explanation we came up with is that these children, maybe because they, I mean, they think they're good, but they're anxious, so they may not be participating so much in class, so they don't receive as much feedback from the teachers or the peers, and that allows them to keep thinking that they are good. Can you see? But that, that may prevent them from uh, getting feedback that is necessary for their language development. So in a way, foreign language classroom anxiety, anxiety trumps our ECB. What provokes this anxiety in children? So Kathleen, in, in one of the, uh, of the articles as part of the project, did some interviews with a, a subset of the, of the children. And they mentioned that they were afraid of making mistakes and being corrected, especially by their peers, not so much by the teachers. Because here in Denmark, there's this idea, there's this practice that very often, apparently, teachers ask the other children to help their weaker. So the stronger uh, students are supposed to help the weaker students. So some of the children said that they were afraid of being corrected when they were by their peers, actually. They were also uh, anxious when they had to speak in English in front of the whole class. They were afraid that the other children would laugh at them or criticize them. And then they were also insecure because when the teacher spoke English, which is something that the teachers have to do according to, you know, to their regulations, they were afraid not to, anxious about not understanding what the teacher was saying in English. And they also were um, insecure about not being, being able to do tasks that, were, that they thought that they didn't have the linguistic cap capabilities, abilities to do so. So that they had to do things that were beyond their, 
their linguistic abilities. We also found that the two harder uh, language aptitude, the memory test, the backward, and the, the number learning were also significant uh, factors. So the higher the memory scores, the higher the L2 proficiency. And that, I mean, corroborates what previous work has uh, shown. With contextual factors, we found something interesting, and that is that we found in relation to extramural English, we found that the type of extramural activity that was more beneficial for second language development was actually was different for the two groups. So watching films in English, so this watching um, audiovisual material, was relatively speaking more beneficial for the young learners, for the early starters, whereas reading was relatively more beneficial for the older learners. It doesn't mean that watching films is not beneficial for the late starters, but it means that relatively speaking or relatively in relation to the other factors, watching these films is more beneficial for the early starters and reading for the late starters. And this kind of makes sense going back to the literature like, you know, if we look at reading and what we know about reading in a second language, um, there's this idea that in order to, um, to be good readers in a second language, there are two factors that are important. One is how good you are in, you know, in how, how good reader you are in your first language, and also how good you are in the, in the second language. And we know that the early starters, they have lower English proficiency. We've seen that. They have lower English proficiency than the elder learners. And they have also poorer L1 Danish reading skills because they're younger and they are not so advanced in, in, in knowing how to read in Danish. Says operationalized as total yearly income, or income was also a significant factor in our, in our models. And, uh, and this... I mean, we're not the first ones to, to find this. Uh, there's some research here conducted with Danish L1 acquisitions who also found that totally year income has, uh, is an important factor. And it's quite interesting because, you know, according to a, a report by the OECD in 2016, Denmark is one or the lowest degree of income inequality in the world, but it's still, but it's still um, a income has an, an effect. In relation to the relative contribution of the two type of uh, factors, it was quite interesting because we found that the child-specific factors had a stronger weight than the contextual. So they explained 36% of the total variance for the PVT and 41 for the truck. And that, if you remember, are the same results that was found in naturalistic settings. So why? Well, because we've said that children here in Denmark are very much exposed to English, so probably, you know, they get enough exposure to the language so that these more internal characteristics can play a role. And this, this is a very interesting discussion because uh, there's some researchers abroad that are saying that English has a special status in some European countries, like in the Netherlands, like in the Nordic countries. And actually, this is something that is also being discussed locally here in Denmark as well. Uh, you know, whether really Denmark, uh, English is a foreign language or not. I mean, they are saying that, you know, this is in Danish, this is from a research, recent article in 2022. So they say that uh, in Denmark that they are developing from being a, a monolingual country in Danish to being, uh, you know, a bilingual or multilingual with English as a second language and officially. So. And another in, an important in implication is that it's not good enough when we talk about this kind of research to say this is a naturalistic or this is an instructed setting because we really have to look at the specific characteristics of the context, right? Because Denmark is kind of in between. We also um, found that um, this difference in proficiency between the, the early and the late they also, they also have consequences for what teachers are able to do in the classrooms. 
So in a, in a study, in, this is the qualitative, um, where they looked at the same teacher. That was nice. In one of the schools, there was the same teacher teaching an early starter and a late starter class. And they found that, you know, uh, actually teachers were sensitive to the language proficiency of the students, right? So in the late starter class, so those who studied in the third, uh, great, they spoke mainly English, and if there were problems of understanding in the class, they continued with English, but they used gestures and reformulations to try to make students understand. Whereas in the early starter class, more Danish was being used. And when there were problems of understanding, you know, the teacher was translating more into Danish. So to conclude, so the younger is not the better so far, according to our data. I mean, Older learners, they start with higher proficiency, they have a rate advantage, they are faster learners, and after two years of instruction, they have not surpassed the, the, uh, the, old, the, the older learners. Uh, but what happens more, you know, when it's longer term, and I'll get back to this in a moment, we've seen that some factors have an equal role for both age groups, so socioeconomic status, foreign language classroom anxiety, ECB, language aptitude, and gender in, 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 relation, in, in relation to the fact that boys were generally, they had higher scores. So that, those factors were constant. They did not vary for the two groups. Whereas other factors, they had a differential role for each age group. We saw that it was especially the late started boys that were faster in the development. And we saw that the type of extramural English activities, you know, one type of activity was more beneficial than the others. Some pedagogical implications, given that foreign language classroom anxiety seems to be, um, you know, to have such a big effect that, you know, overrides the, 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 the role of uh, how good you think you are. Um, maybe it's important for teachers to you know, to explain well enough that making errors is a natural part of learning a foreign language, it's okay, that some error correction is necessary and should not be taken as an attack to the personality, to the person, to the student as such. Maybe it's better that this is done by the teacher and not so much by the peers, since in, in your article, you know, the thing is that, well, you know, they were more anxious when it was the peers that they were correcting them. Uh, because, you know, teachers have to use English in the class. It's a good idea to make them understand that it's okay, that it's normal, that they're not going to understand everything from the beginning. I mean, that, that would be a miracle. And that help understanding via gestures, visuals, and, well, occasional use of Dennis, if, if necessary, in order to, to try to uh, lower anxiety. Extramural English, it's very important that teachers understand how much English can be learned outside the classroom. And, uh, and, you know, that it could be a good idea to watch, that this idea of watching audiovisual material from the beginning would be good also inside the classroom. And then wait with asking them to read later on when the learners are better at reading in the first. So, uh, this is to... Finish, so um, we, this is the, the two groups, right? The data that I've told you about, it's about this. But, I mean, time flies. <laughs> and in the spring in 2021, you know, the latest studies, they were already in the ninth, in the ninth grade. Mm. So, and the early studies were in the seventh grade. So we've collected data. So we have data from these same children. Um, where we gave them two um, different tests than the other ones, because the other ones were being too easy for them. They were at ceiling. And, oops, yes. And now we're collecting data now, so we can see, you know, in the long run, will it be better or not? And then, so that's what we're going to do. And, um, yeah. It would be nice to work with teachers and see how we can make a better bridge between what they do outside and inside the classroom. And this is something that I think would be very interesting. What happens, what implication does this starting with English have for bilingual children in Denmark? Children who are, you know, who are struggling with learning Danish and then suddenly in the first grade they have to start with 
English as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I went over time. Yes, you did, but that's fine. Yeah. Probably what you said is much better than what we have. Before. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. We have a microphone, not for this room, but for those watching online. So please wait until you get the microphone. The last part of that. First, first. That was in between the interview. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was going to ask about one of your last points. Yes. Whether English really is a foreign language yeah. in the Scandinavian countries. Yeah. Because doesn't that have quite a big implication for the transfer value of this if you think about other second languages, so like German in Denmark, for instance? That that's a completely whole game now, isn't it? That in a way English should not be treated as a a second language acquisition, mm -hmm. uh, at least for the younger uh, yes. generation. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't it so that the the proficiency of the whole population is going up in English, mm -hmm. and it's definitely going down in German and <laughs> French? And, uh, it's definitely going. <laughs> yeah, I think you know. I, I think it's a it's a very important debate because um, because there is a difference with English versus the other foreign languages with respect to you know, the amount of contact that people have to the language. So maybe to German, you know, in the, in, if you are in southern Jutland, then maybe you can have a little bit of more exposure outside. But there's no doubt that English has another status. And that, you know, according to, to some um, definitions of what bilinguals are, you could argue actually that things are, you know, because bilingual can be defined as a regular use of two or more languages. And, you know, because we know that things, you know, from this data that children are using this language regularly, you know, uh, you could argue that, yes, that, that, that it's not a foreign language in the traditional sense. And, you know, it's the language that is cool, right? I mean, because of all the series, because of all the games, it's in English. And I think the thing with German, it may be, I mean, there's something research done on linguistic attitudes. I mean, I'm not a researcher on, on German, but I think, you know, the, the, the ideas, the, the, the attitudes that you have towards the language and how the language was taught and how, what you can do with that language, I think English has a clear status there in relation to German, to French, or other languages. I don't know if I answer your question. So German is not cool, just... No, 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 no! <laughs> no, that's not... I know, I know, I know. No! <laughs> it may what? not be as cool, maybe. But I mean, Richard needs to be done in that. Yeah. No, but I mean, the, the, the motivation can be different, right? Yeah. Hi, very nice talk. Actually, I'm just wondering in the context of adult learning languages like us. Yes, like us. Yeah. So oh, there is there's now increased popularity of many apps, right? So of you can apps. see Duolingo, no, yeah. Babel, whatever. Yeah. Ha have you put that into the context of how we learn languages hmm. with respect to digital platforms versus books versus classical classroom settings? Hmm. Well, if you use these apps, outside the classroom, then it could be categorized as, you know, happening outside the classroom. I mean, there are some teachers. I had a, a master's student who did her, his, his, his special MA thesis and looked at the, the use of an app. I think it was Duolingo, actually, inside the classroom and how it could be combined. But if you do it outside of the classroom, then, you know, it could, it could go into the... I would put it together with the extra moral English thing. Uh, but it's a, of a different nature, right? Because when you use an app, then you can get corrected feedback. So, I mean, there, there, it has some particular characteristics. And I don't think this, I don't know about uh, Sine, if you know of research that has compared, for example, looking at the uh, apps versus another type of uh, extra moral English. No, I don't think Done on that. No, I don't think I it's don't been done. No. But, uh, but it, it, yes, it's, it's an interesting thing because it's a different animal than, than watching films or playing games. Yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah, really interesting stuff. Uh, just, just two comments. Can't I think. I can't hear. Uh,
Oh yeah, um, just just two comments. Uh, some, um, uh, one is that I think the problem is to me it seems that that finding out whether it's best teaching them in the first and second, third grade is is really it's a sort of confounded, it's a very compounded treatment. You get a lot that if you start with first grade, you you have to, you have you have English for for se- for more years. You yeah. also start earlier, and it's really hard to separate these two these two mechanisms. Also, that. It helps that you you survey them in, in the ninth grade where they're at the same age, but the age yes. is also a confounder. So I don't know whether there's any way out of this, but but I think it, it, it's a huge uh, uh, issue. Another thing is that with regards to uh, uh, parents' socioeconomic status, you measure it by par- parental income, right? Yes, well, we had measures of income, but we also had measures of uh, education. Yeah, because I would... Uh, I would sort of go for the education part. I think most well, studies... Well we, well, we included both measures. We included both in the models, but education did not turn out to be significant. That's but actually, income yet. I that's know. actually quite interesting we because most right. studies yes, show the, shows the opposite. I know. Well, I know that previous research usually shows that it's especially maternal education that is a, that is a more significant factor, but we did include it. We, I mean, all these factors were included in the model, but, but it did not turn out. But to be you, 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 you included it in the model where you also had like um, the, the the children test scores, right? So, so basically, yes, yes. they yeah. Because yes, again, yes. in the model we had the factors, and then we had yeah. uh, then then and then you know the proficiency level. Of course, that yeah. was a dependent variable. But then it makes more sense because I think what what usually that the mother's education is proxies for sort of the hereditary part of intelligence, and you already yes, measured that. Again, I um, I think what the using like socioeconomic status when 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 education the mother's education acts uh, as a socioeconomic status it's used in my opinion just proxies for the the hereditary part of intelligence but oh. you 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 basically measure the intelligence of the child so it makes a little bit more sense that it, that that mother's education don't really have any an oh. effect because yeah. you basically it's it's and I think also a lot of these issues that it's it's very what what some you sometimes call post treatment so you have a lot of variables in the controls that are basically the causes of one another and you include them in the same model. Um, so I think sort of maybe reading up on, on, on that, I think, because I think the model choice, um, you may have to rethink the model choice for the, for the next part of the project. Um, but I look forward to following it. What we did with the model, maybe Mikkel and uh, <laughs> John can do it here, but I mean, we did include the different uh, factors as, uh, as uh, main effects, no? and then also with uh, looking for interactions with uh, age, of onset and with uh, gender. Uh, so we included them all that and then we eliminated uh, backwards uh, those who did not uh, reach the p value of uh, 0.1. And that is, John, maybe you can put the statistics here, maybe you can say something about that because you can see that you're, <coughs> yes? Yeah, regarding the uh, variable elimination from the model, well, well, we had a, a number of interactions to the model, but we, but we examined them in a in a in a in, in, in an informed manner, not by mechanistic uh, forward backward, but but in an informed manner where we where we, where we uh, examined them individually and uh, built up the model gradually. So, uh, so but, but you're completely right. Uh, that, that, that there were many factors that that we needed to, to account carefully for. And we did our best to, to account for that. But as you may know, that, that there is no uh, decisive, objective way of, 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 of doing that. So it's a matter of uh, trial and error when you do it in, 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 in practice. I hope that answers the question. Okay, I did see more fingers, but I'm getting hungry. Yeah. So <laughs> we will stop for now. Thank you so much for your question. Yeah. Thank you for attending.